this is what the Lord dropped in my heart. So I know it's 1134, and I don't want to keep you real long, but I do think it's important that we eat the word. Amen? That we, uh, that we meditate on scriptures and chew on scriptures. So one more time, if you would, put your hand on your heart. And the title is, Forbid Your Hardened Heart to Grieve the Heart of God. Can you say that with me? Forbid your hardened heart to grieve the heart of God. And that's from Mark chapter 3, verse 5. So Lord, we ask you, if there is anything, like we said earlier, any areas of our heart that have been hardened through the betrayal that we've experienced in our lives, or pain that we've experienced, or trauma, we know that's not the final condition that you want for us to be in, but that you desire for us to be walking in the fullness of our relationship with you. So please open our eyes, open our ears, reveal what you want to show us today as we crack open the truth of the Word of God. You said to eat this book and uh, let it be a very uh, tasty meal and a nourishing meal for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so Mark chapter 3. You know, Mark, he just kind of jumped right in. His gospel is shorter than the others, but he covers a lot of ground in those 16 chapters. This is Mark 3. In verse 4, it says, Then he, tur he, Jesus, turned to the Pharisees with a question. And he said, Do our laws tell us to do good or evil on the Sabbath, to save life or snuff it out? They remained silent. Jesus was furious. You don't read that a lot, do you? You don't read that he was furious a lot in the Bible, but we know he didn't sin, so we know that not, you don't necessarily sin if you're angry about something. But you are on pretty dangerous ground, when you're angry, that you could sin. So be the Lord of my emotions, right? We sang that today. Set me free from selfish motives. Uh, Jesus had no selfish motives, but he was angry at the Pharisees because he wanted to heal somebody, but it was the Sabbath. And they had set up their rules in such a way that they wanted to have control and power over people. So can that happen in the church today? Yeah. Do we want that to happen? No. Does God want that to happen? No. And part of it is because the church is vulnerable. The church wants to be taught. The church wants to be mentored. And if our, if our pump in the, in the leadership, if, if the motives of the people that are in, in charge are in any way about their own agenda and their own ministry and to build themselves up, then that's not coherent with the gospel, right? He's washing feet, remember? He said, I didn't come to serve, be served. Sorry, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. And the greatest title of all is servant. Not apostle, not prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher. Those are all wonderful titles and really important gifts in the body of Christ. But servant, according to Jesus, I'm just quoting him now, right? So here he was looking at the servants that represented God to the people, and he was seeing a hard heart because he was seeing them want to, to build up their own agenda and their own ministry and their own power and maintain that power by following rules more than missing the spirit. They were missing the spirit of the law by following the letter of the law. And he said, you know, you guys are great at straining out the gnat, but you're swallowing the camel. So we have to be careful of that in every area of our lives. Because Christians aren't known exactly for being flexible and understanding. The criticism that unsafe people have is that we're too rigid and that we're not well informed. And, and religious means... Not, not a good listener to a lot of the people I work with on Wall Street anyway. It's like, well, you know, they seem to have a script and they're just reading off a script, but life is more complicated. You know, look, I'm not trying to get there today. You do have to know that the word and, and, and we don't change God's law. But when Holy Spirit's at work in you, you can explain the truth of God's word to somebody who's not abiding by God's word and it can be done in a way that they want to hear more because it's anointed. And they don't typically like to be lectured or shamed or made fun of, do they? Come on, anybody here who's witnessed, you know that. So Jesus is really upset because the people who should have been reflecting the heart of God were not reflecting his heart. They were reflecting the opposite because he wanted to heal somebody and they were going to call him out. And we've all got to watch that. That's my warning. I forbid my hardened heart to grieve the heart of God. That's a good prayer. And let's just be honest. Could there be a part of our heart that's been hardened that we just don't recognize yet? Yeah. Thank you. I'm trying to give you the easy questions <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, there could be. And Paul specifically says this in the Bible. Just because I'm not aware of it does not excuse me. Right. 
I still have to be open to what the Lord wants to show me, but also what my brothers and sisters in Christ want to show me. Why do you think they call it a blind spot? Because we can't see it. So verse 5 in Mark 3 says, Jesus was furious as he looked out over the crowd, and he was grieved by their hard hearts of the leaders. So I'm not going to be that person to the, to the degree that I can be aware of it. Lord, show me so that I maintain your heart and not this pulling rank that the Pharisees were so good at. And then right out of the Psalms, it said today, Psalm 95, verse 7 through 9, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as what? Say it with me. As in the rebellion. Okay, so there we go. There's a linkage between rebellion and hard hearts. And we heard a great minister many years ago talk about uh, frogs. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's a biblical principle. And stiff-necked people in the Old Testament and he said, why do you think frogs are pictured in a bad light? Because they can't turn their head. They have no neck. Talk about stiff neck, right? You remember that? I don't know if you remember that, but that was Mark Hamby. There's several people here that could have been there that day, but I just never forgot that. And well, when they were in the wilderness, they are murmuring and complaining and murmuring and complaining. We know that's not our model today. But it's easy for us to shift back to that, isn't it? All right. So don't harden your hearts as in the day of the rebellion, as in the day of the trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. And here he is. He wants to heal right, right in front of them. And they're saying, no, that's illegal. You can't do that here because that's considered work. And you can lose the forest by looking too close at the trees, can't you? And none of us like when that happens to us. But we better realize that other people don't like it when we do that to them. Tone deaf, you know that expression? Yeah. Be in a conversation, and you say the person was tone deaf. They weren't picking up the signals. They weren't discerning about what was going on in the room because they were too busy with their list and too busy trying to get everything accomplished that they missed the bigger picture. Just say, not me. I have my heart open to the Lord, and I'm going to listen to you and not just assume things. Right. You all know what assume, if you break that word up, I won't say it here. But. <laughs> 10 and 11. For 40 years, I was grieved with that generation. For 40 years, he was grieved with the generation. They saw miracles. They were getting daily bread. And yet, they were still stubborn and complaining. Wow, what a warning to us, right? I refuse. I forbid a hardened heart in me to grieve the heart of God. They just got too caught up in their emotions. And I was grieved that that generation said, it's a people who go astray in their hearts. They go astray in their hearts. I know ba uh, Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Myers is a great book, but there's a battlefield in the heart too. Yeah. Maybe somebody write a book on that. Just give me some credit. <laughs> so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And if you ever notice that about religious people and religious tendencies, they're never happy. Never, they're never doing enough. Never. If you're working in three ministries, then why are you working in five? And then they're going to compare you to somebody else who's working in six. Right? Oh. Thank you, Corey. So Hebrews 3 talks about the same scripture. It says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you. Come on, say it with me. An okay, they said it pretty good. An evil heart of unbelief. This is a warning. He starts with the word beware, right? So if he's saying beware, that's a warning. Lest in there be in any of you. He's talking to believers. So this could be us. Beware that there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily when it is called today, lest any of you be hardened. Today. Can you look at somebody and say today? today. This means right now. Right? Because this could happen again tomorrow. So tomorrow is your next today. So this is something we have to look at all the time. We have to be aware of our spiritual condition. And we have to recognize if we're off kilter, if something got us upset, that's not a good time to make a big decision. That's the time to back off and say, look, I, I'm sorry, I'm just in a rough spot right now emotionally, and I'm afraid if I make a big decision right now, and boy, the devil hates when you do that, because he wants you to make that decision in that moment of anger. And if you're in an argument with somebody, this could happen on your job very easily. They could put out the bait to try to get you angry, and then you respond, and they record your response, or they save that email that you sent that was all in letter 95 font, all capitals. Bold, bad move that never goes away, right? Don't take the bait. That was John Bevere's book, The Bait of Satan is Offense. Don't take the bait. 
<laughs> Verse 14, for if we become partakers of Christ, no, sorry, we have become partakers of Christ if. Don't you, I don't like that word. That means it's conditional. <laughs> we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And many of you might have uh, seen the memorial service that we did for Joe Gregorian not too long ago, and many of you here knew him. And he came up to me after my mother had passed, and he said, I just want to tell you, Pastor, your mom ministered to me so much. I'm sure there's other people. Anybody else here would say that? They knew my mom and she ministered. Yeah, she was a walk-in machine of, of encouragement. And, and he said, you know, I already mentioned his name. His name is David. And it's the only person in the Bible that God said he was a man after my own heart, right? right. Not because he was perfect, because he certainly was very flawed. But God doesn't look at your flaws as much as he looks at your heart. Right. And that's right in this story, all the way back in, you know, 1 Samuel 16, when the prophet went and he said, oh, this must be the one based on the outward appearance, one of Jesse's sons, right? And, and God said, no, you don't get it. You're looking, the, your, your mental position, man looks at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. So if you didn't get that out of today's worship service, I don't know, watch the, watch the recording because it was all about our heart. And it's going to continue to be about our heart and the condition of our heart and a recognition if our heart is starting to get hardened. We want to give you some tools to avoid that. Call up for prayer right then before the rigor mortis sets in. A stiffening when somebody's body is dying. Their body stiffens because it loses oxygen. Right? That's a really good metaphor. So if you cut yourself off from the body of Christ and you're meditating on the wrong things and you're falling into a pit of depression about your circumstances, you're, you're missing the oxygen of brothers and sisters in Christ who will pray with you. And that's why you need belief around you. You need to be with people that believe, that have the faith for the miracles. We talked about that last week. So David was on the run from Saul for quite a while. And I believe that he had battle fatigue. You all know what battle fatigue is? You know, this is the time of year that they're starting a football camp, and I used to play a middle linebacker when I was in high school, and then I went to the University of Miami my freshman year, and it's 98 degrees in the summer in Miami, and it's 98% humidity, and there's something called triple sessions. Anybody know what triple sessions are? Yeah. Right, double sessions is high school. That was in the morning and in the afternoon, but at a big college like that, there was three times a day you had to walk on the field with other people who were 300 pounds that wanted to kill you. These are your teammates, by the way, because they want to make the team, and, and, you know, there's only going to be a certain amount of guys that make the team. So you don't bring your B game in a situation like that, right? you got to have you, you, your wits about you, and you're just exhausted. And when you're that physically tired, you don't make good decisions, right? And, and all of us should be aware of that. Life may deal you a difficult hand, but recognize the condition of your spirit when you're about to make an important decision. I don't know. You can decide. We'll look at this. I'm only taking selective uh, verses here. But in 1 Samuel 25, David had already been on the run from Saul for a really long time. He'd been out in the wilderness hiding from Saul. And there was a man named Nabal who was a wealthy man with lots of uh, uh, sheep that were out in the field. And David's men were protecting them. So in verse 8, David's men go to Nabal and say, please return to our kindness and look on my young men with favor since we come on this feast day. Please give whatever you can spare to them and to your son David. And Nabal's response to David's men was, should I take bread and water and meat from my own servants and give it to men who come from who knows where? Never heard of this guy, David. So they go back and they're going to talk to David and say, oh, David, you know, sorry, uh, Nabal, Nabal didn't think it was a good idea to give us uh, any, any food. So that's called a fork in the road, right? You have to decide what you're going to do with that. A lot of Christians think this is the only way out, right? Oh, no problem. That's okay. But because David is in this really heightened emotional state of being on the run for so long, he's, he's going into the third session of practice in 98 degree heat. And he is just so worn out, and he's so tired. But look, there's this root system in him. Like back in uh, 1 Samuel 17, right? That was five, seven chapters ago. He said to Goliath, the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Like if anybody wasn't going to rely on the arm of the flesh, it would have been David. 
But I think because he was in this hijacked emotional condition, he, like I, sometimes get this picture in my brain. <laughs> and I could hear the chains shaking. And this inner gorilla linebacker is going, let me out, let me out. I want to kill Nabal, like who is he, right? How easy is this? And we have to control our spirit because that happens if there's a hardened heart. That we're not operating in the full flow of Holy Spirit. And you only have to miss it a little to still be off, right? So did he let the gorilla out of the cage? Yep. <laughs> this is what I would describe my father's temper as. <laughs> Mushroom, nuclear, <laughs> like hide. <laughs> but he lost his temper, boy. Woo, you don't want to be around him. Trisha got one little taste of it before we got married and we said that we weren't going to serve alcohol at the wedding and he was not happy about that. Uh, and he was, you know, he was a very good man. He wasn't overly, you know, involved with alcohol, but he, he, it just didn't fit his grid of his culture, right? So whatever, different story. But this, is, this could happen to any one of us, okay? Because when you get into that hijacked state and you get offended because somebody didn't do what you expected them to do, this is what he said. It wasn't a long response to his men. They come back and said, no, he said he wasn't going to do it. He said, strap on your swords. And I'm sure he didn't say it like, oh, strap on your sword. That's not the way that works, is it? And now you feel. And what happens? You have a whole conversation going on in your brain, don't you? And that's called self-talk. And that's toxic self-talk. And that's why Paul said, think on these things. Whatever's good, whatever's pure. But boy, it's a battle, isn't it? And that Paul, you know, he's a pretty serious guy. And he said, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. Who's going to save me from this? Please give me the answer. You can always, you'll be right 50% of the time if you say Jesus. <laughs> so he says, strap on your swords. But look at this, this is a real key. I'll tell you what, about a hardened heart, we call it inner vows. And they don't use the word vow. He had made an oath, it says in verse 21. Earlier, David had made an oath. David, this is his self-talk. It looks as though we protected everything this guy owns so that he lost none of the things belonging to him for nothing. We did it for nothing. We did him a, we did him a good turn, and now he rewards us with evil. May the true God, now he's calling on God to back up his bad opinion here, right? May the true God do so to my enemies and more if tomorrow morning I've left a single male of Nabal's house alive, is what that says. So this is a murderous spirit that's fueling his tank. And he pulled up and he filled his tank with fury. Wow. And now there's a whole lot more than Nabal. Now it's the frustration of all those years of being on the run when he knew Samuel had anointed him to be king. And now all this frustration was building. And if any of you are married, you know what happens in an argument, right? It's not just about the thing you're arguing about in that moment because there's usually a few chapters behind that that tend to get brought up in that conversation. I've heard about that. It never happened to me and Trish, but I've heard that happens to people on occasion. Woo! <laughs> so we just go back. I'm going to come back and finish with, with uh, David because at least there was a happy ending to that one anyway. But let's just unpack where we started in Mark chapter 3. It's familiar to you, right? It says, on the Sabbath, Jesus had come into the synagogue where he saw a man with a withered hand, and the Pharisees held their breath. Not a good thing, right? Would Jesus cure this man on the Sabbath right there in front of everyone? If so, they could charge him with breaking the Sabbath law. We talk about missing the forest for the trees. When was the last time they healed anybody? Who cares what it is? You don't do it at all. And you're going to call it work. And this is why people hate religion. Because it looks like we're, we're missing the bigger picture and focusing on little things. And if they don't have the understanding of Holy Spirit, you've got to live with them. And you have to build credibility with people. Not always, I mean, there's always an exception to every rule. But in general, you speak more by your actions than your words. And they want to see authenticity and they want to see that there's really something different about you. That's when you have more ability to convey the heart of God to them, right? These guys didn't have that. They, they can't wait to, to, to arrest somebody and write the ticket and put them in jail. 
to constantly prove that they knew the law better, but they didn't have the heart of God. Jesus knew their hearts. That's very telling. He called the man, sorry, with the withered hand, and he said, come to me. And he turned to the Pharisees with a question. Do our laws tell us to do good or evil on the Sabbath, to save life or snuff it out? And they remained silent. And he was furious as he looked over the crowd, and he was grieved by their hard hearts. And then Jesus says to the man with the withered hand, so be it, stretch out your hand. The man stretched forth his hand, and as he did, it was completely healed. Anybody here been completely healed of something? Come on, let's get a little noise going. This is true. This is how this works, right? The man got completely healed, and the Pharisees went directly from the synagogue to consult with the supporters of Herod, the Roman's puppet ruler, about how they could get rid of this dangerous dreamer. Hmm. Good name for Jesus? Yeah. He's a dangerous streamer. He believes God can break all the laws of nature and do miracles in our midst. Yeah. And I think he loves it when we're dangerous streamers too. Yeah. Right? In the, in the context of this verse, I'll take that title all day long. Because I was a dangerous delinquent before I got saved. So if i got to be dangerous something, I'd rather be a dangerous dreamer for God. Yeah. And then this is clear. I'm, I'm actually going to skip through this. It was just another example. And I, and I, because of the time, I'll just get back to Abigail. Because now this is really a picture for us about the hard heart. Because in the course of your day, God will give you opportunities while you're on your way to commit the dirty deed. <laughs> right? Like, he's about to go kill a bunch of people, but he hasn't gotten there yet. And often the Holy Spirit will be speaking to you like, are you sure you want to do this? Right? A Holy Spirit. And you're like, look, just look the other way for a little while, Holy Spirit, and then come back to me later. And I'll repent because you said you have to forgive me. Well, people do this all the time. It's called rationalize. Hmm. So you know what the road to perdition is? Yeah, perdition's not a good thing, right? It's, it's your, you're about to go do something evil. And sons of perdition is a title in the Bible. You don't want that title. So while David's on the road, God loves this guy, and he decides to use somebody to step in the gap to try to turn his heart. You think God would do that for you? See, I told you, I'm asking easy questions. Because he loves you. So even when you're about to do something really bad, you could sing Waymaker. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. And it could be through somebody who has tattoos. <gasps> God could use somebody with tattoos? But he doesn't want tattoos. Well, why don't you let them get saved first and make their own decision about that? Instead of deciding in advance, like uh, God could use a donkey? Yeah, he could use a donkey. Anyway, you get my point. It's about not judging people. I don't like tattoos. I would never tell anybody to get a tattoo. But man, if you knew the things I did before I got saved. So Abigail intercepts David. Holy Spirit will intercept you if you're aware. But a hard heart stops you from being aware. So if you just prayed in the morning before you left the house and say, Lord, soften my heart today. If there's any callus, if there's any scar tissue, I don't want to miss your message to me because my tuner's not fully lined up with the right satellite dish. Right? Like, that's a bad problem. You don't want the world speaking into you. You want the Lord speaking into you because the world's going to lead you in a ditch. All right. So in, in 1 Samuel 25, she gets the message back from the messengers of, of Nabal, and she runs down and brings the supplies. And as soon as she sees David on the road to come kill her family, basically, she got off her donkey, fell on her knees at his feet, and face to the ground and said, my master, let me take the blame, let me speak to you. I wasn't there when your young men came, and, and uh, my master arrived, I didn't see them. And now my master, as God lives, as, and as you live, God has kept you from this avenging murder. She's a pretty smart lady, don't you think? Like, she's like, David, you're about to make a really big mistake, and you have a really big calling on your life. But what do you want to be known for, a man after God's own heart or a man who took matters into your own hands? When you're the one that told David, I'm sorry, Goliath, the battle belongs to the Lord. And here you are, contradicting yourself. You need to go back and read what you said to Goliath. We don't want to hear that in the moment that we're angry. Because the world says vengeance is sweet. That's a lie. That's a lie. Let's break that one right now, okay? It's sweet to the devil. 
Because now he has a reason to legally come and attack you. Because you took matters in your own hands. Oh boy, this could go on for a few hours, couldn't it? I can see some of you are not real happy with this message. What do you mean I can't take that? I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. It's 4th of July. Give me a break. <laughs> this avenging murder. Wow, that's such good wording. He is keeping you. God has kept you. By me being here, you're going to get a last warning before you get to the road to perdition. And then forgive my presumption because she knows he's been called to be king. But God is at work in my master. You, David, developing a rule, solid and dependable. My master fights God's battles. And as long as you live, evil will, I'm sorry, as long as you live, no evil will stick to you. She's prophesying over him, his destiny. She's a heathen married to a guy that she named a fool. Right? That's how she de described her husband. As long as you live, no evil will stick to you. I think she could have said, unless you let it, unless you open the door by trying to take matters into your own hands. If anyone stands in your way, if anyone tries to get you out of the way, know this. Your God-honored life is tightly bound in the bundle of the God-protected life. Wow. You want a good memory verse? There you go. Wow. This is the same David in the cave when his men said to kill Saul, said, no, I won't touch God's anointed. Right. But look at how being hijacked emotionally can get us so messed up. And, you know, David, thankfully, the lives of your enemies will be hurled aside as a stone is thrown from a sling. She knows the example to use for David because he knows how to use a sling. So change your picture, David. Stop imagining how good it's going to feel to kill these people and start imagining how good it's going to feel when God takes over this situation instead of you and that you continue to chase your true destiny, not the counterfeit that the devil wants you to have. These days, it's recorded, it's videotaped, and every email you ever send, there's a record of it. So if ever there was a time to be aware of not having a hardened heart, because that's one of the conditions that leads you to making really bad decisions. So I don't want it. I don't know about you, but I sure don't want it. <laughs> and then she continues to prophesy in verse 30. She says, when God completes all the goodness that he has, promise my master and set you up as a prince over Israel, my master will not have this dead weight in his heart. Dead weight in his heart. The guilt of an avenging murder. This woman is filled with the wisdom of the Holy Ghost right there, don't you think? Like, wow, she was understanding in the spirit how David was going to be hijacked by the devil and have a mark against him that the devil could then legally charge him with. Oh. And when God has worked things out for, for good for my master, remember me. And there's a longer answer, but this is what he said. We could stand now, okay? So I'm going to end here. Thank you, Nate. I love you too, brother. I'm feeling the love. <laughs> oh, boy. Look at David's answer. He, he comes awake. He's like the prodigal son in the pigsty. It says he came to his senses. Don't you love that about God? Can anybody hear a time in your life when that happened? When you were about to go down the wrong path and you came to your senses. Yes. yes. Hallelujah. It's yes. my wife saying to me, did you pray about it? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, prayer. That's right. God did say to do that. And often she was right. I was just operating in my natural fuel and my natural, you could say it's a strength in the natural, but an overplayed strength becomes a weakness in the spirit because you become too reliant on what you're good at. Listen to this recording again. That's worth talking about. But David said, Blessed be God, the God of Israel. He sent you to meet me. He sent you to meet me. And I'm telling you, every time we come to church, you could think this about other believers in the body of Christ. We're not just here to mark time on our way to get to heaven. We're here because we're, we're busy about the Father's business all week, and we can encourage one another, give testimonies, and, and hear the word of the Lord that was given to the people that are teaching. And, and one of the things that Trisha said to me two weeks ago was, we really need to talk about a hard heart. You know, let's, let's just press into that for a little while. And I've come to understand and trust it. Like, well, no, he didn't tell me that. But we're one, right? So we, we try to flow well together. I'm not looking at her right now, but I think we do. 
He says, bless you for keeping me from this murder. And I could say to my beautiful bride, bless you for keeping me from murderous activity. <laughs> she would definitely say that to me because I know I have kept her from that. <laughs> Not quite murderous, I, I qualify. <laughs> she does such a good job of hiding her emotions, you'd never know she was upset. I love her. 35 years. I hope we're not about to get divorced. I really, I mean, I, I'm not just saying this. No, no, I mean it. I'm just, she's awesome. And uh, we're one. Okay? No, I'm, I'm trying to just send you a prophetic message right now that you're not an adversary to your spouse. You're an you should listen. You might not agree with everything, but listen and pray because they don't wake up in the morning thinking how they can make your life miserable. Okay? Even though it might sound that way. That could be a hard heart, right? You don't want to have a hard heart with your spouse. Okay? Right. Can you lift your hand? I don't know what's happening with this. Can I have that mic there, Linda, please? I'm sorry. I just don't want this to cut out. That's why we hired Reyes. <laughs> Starting next week. So Lord, help us not to have a hard heart towards you. And just say this with me, okay? I forbid my hardened heart from grieving the heart of God. Make me aware when I'm not understanding the spiritual principles at work, open my eyes. Give me ears to hear that like Abigail, I could receive the, uh, the advice from Holy Spirit and stay out of the ditch and on the right path to you, Lord. In Jesus' name. All right. Well, I'm just going to pray for you all now. Okay. You have anything you want to say? So, Lord, I'm grateful for every person that's here right now. I thank you that we could celebrate this holiday and enjoy our day off tomorrow from work and just rejoice in the freedom that we have in America. Celebrate the veterans, y'all. If you know veterans, remember, this is partly why we have freedom in our country, because they were willing to die uh, in, in the battle to keep us free. And I think we are still having prayer here today, so you don't have to run out. And we're also having uh, fellowship outside if you don't have to run off either. So, Lord, I just thank you for this awesome body of King of Kings. I thank you that these folks are sensitive to your spirit and that we're hearing you. We're hearing your voice. We're understanding your word with deeper and deeper revelation because you want revival to come to this region. And we say, start here, Lord. Start with me and start here in Jesus' name. Everybody say it. Hallelujah. Have an awesome day. Love you.